find you have trouble with the APIs in your organization? Do services struggle to interact with each other because their APIs are misunderstood or they change in breaking ways? Could you point to the definition of an API for a given service, let alone to a catalog of all of them available in your estate? Have you maybe tried to use an API gateway to bring all of this under control, but do you find it doesn't quite feel like the right tool for this job? I'm Matt Turner, and in this talk today, I'm going to talk about some more modern techniques and tools for managing your APIs. We're going to see what API gateways really do, what they're useful for, and where they can be replaced by some more modern tooling. So in the first half of this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, what an API is, just very briefly, get us back on the same page, talk about what an API gateway is, where they came from, and why I'm talking about them, and then we're going to look at sidecars, which I think are a, a sort of more modern, distributed, microservice style alternative. I'm then going to look at some more tooling around the sort of the, the life cycle of an API. So some of these stages you might be familiar with in the design and development of an API. I think API gateways have been pressed into helping us with a lot of these things as well. But actually, rather than using an API gateway or a sidecar, there are some, uh, you know, rather than using a component of the network, like an online active component at runtime, there's a bunch of more modern tooling now that enables us to do this earlier in the dev cycle to sort of shift these concerns left. So I'm going to be covering that as well in the second half of this talk. So API gateways and sidecars. Let's just very briefly, I know this is uh, QCon and the audience is very sophisticated, but let's very briefly go over uh, what I mean by API, uh, at least for the purposes of this talk. So uh, let's start off easy, right? What isn't an API? The definition I've come up with is that an API is the definition of an external interface of some kind of service. Service is you know open to interpretation, workload, endpoint, you where you want to call it, but there's a way of interacting with it and talking to it from the outside, and that's that's what an API is. Wikipedia, and you know, sorry to cite Wikipedia, but I don't think this explanation is too bad. Wikipedia says that an API is a document or a standard that describes how to build or use a software interface, and that that document is called an API specification. And it says that the term API may refer to either the specification or to the implementation. What I really just want us to agree on is for the purposes of this talk, an API is not a piece of code or a running process. So people, I've heard them talk about deploying an API and what they mean is deploying a pod to Kubernetes, you know, deploying uh, some kind of workload to a compute environment. That's, you know, the fact that that service is not a batch processing service, but it's some kind of daemon that has an API, great. But the word API, I think, I think we get confused if we start using the word API for that. So an API, by my definition, you know, how, how do we define it? So an API is defined by an, an IDL, an interface definition language. You may have come across uh, open API specs, formerly called Swagger, or protobuf files, uh, which include the gRPC extensions. And there's you know, Avro and Thrift and a lot of those other protocols have their own IDLs as well. So this is kind of like uh, a C++ header file, a Java interface, a C Sharp interface. So very briefly, you know, a workload, a running process, a pod, can have an API that we can talk to. If you've got more than one of those, you put something in front that you know spreads the work between APIs. This is just sort of classic load balancer. You can have more than one different API on some different workloads, and then you know your your front-facing thing, whatever it is, can expose both of them. You can have a slightly fatter, more intelligent front-facing thing that can combine those backend APIs in some way. So think of this as a you know GraphQL resolver, or even uh, you know a load balancer or, or an API gateway doing some sort of path routing. It's worth saying a, you know, a pod, a service. A workload can actually implement two APIs, two different APIs if you want, like a class having two interfaces, or maybe two versions of the same API, which is something that's going to be quite relevant for us. So what is an API gateway? Well, I'm going to say that they have a set of common features. Uh, they are network gateways, right? I guess the clue is kind of in the name with gateway, and they do things like terminate TLS. They load balance between services, 
they route between services and they, they do service discovery first to find out where those services are. They can do authentication with client certificates, jots and whatever. They can do authorization. Um, so that's, you know, allow listing, block listing, certain uh, hosts, certain paths, certain header combinations, whatever, because it's at layer seven. They do security related stuff. Um, uh, an obvious example would be injecting course headers, but you know, more on that later. They can rate limit and apply quotas. They can cache. They can provide a lot of observability because we send all traffic through them so we can get a lot of observability for free. And then the, you know, some of the common features that get more interesting, more relevant to this talk that I've you know pulled out of uh, a lot of those different product specifications is things like the ability to upload one of those IDL files, uh, like a like an open API spec, and have the API gateway build an internal object model of your API, you know, hosts, paths, methods, uh, and even down to body schema. So enforcing the schema of bodies, request bodies coming in and going out. A lot of them also have some kind of support for versioning APIs, uh, you know, uh, different stages of, of deployment. So maybe a sort of a test, they're staging at a prod version of an API. And a lot of them will also do format translation. So that's maybe gRPC to SOAP or gRPC to, to quote unquote REST, you know, JSON over HTTP. Um, they can do schema transforms. So they might take a, you know, a structured body, like a, a JSON document in one format and, and rearrange some of the fields, rename some of the fields. Uh, and they can manipulate metadata as well. So, you know, insert, modify, delete headers. So why am I talking about these things? Well, back in the day, we had a network, right? And we would probably need some load balancing as soon as we got beyond a toy example. We'd have certain services. Uh, in this case, I'm showing a database that where, you know, where we need more than one copy running for redundancy, for uh, load, you know, uh, carrying ability. So, and we'd have multiple clients as well that needed to talk to those things. So we'd stick a load balancer in the network, you know, sort of logically in the middle. Uh, and these were originally hardware pizza boxes, you know, think an F5 or a Juniper or a Netscaler. And then there were some sort of famous software implementations, something like HA Proxy. Nginx is quite good at doing this. And they balance load service to service, but you also needed one on the edge so that external clients could reach your services at all across that network boundary, discover your services, and, and you know then they would offer those features like load balancing between different copies of the service. So here I've just sort of shown that middle proxy um, copied. We've got another instance of it because it's it's doing some load balancing over, you know, this is probably the 90s or the, or the 2000s. This is, you know, your web tier, right? And then they've got a load balancer in front of your database tier. But because this thing is, is a network gateway, because it's exposed out on the internet, it's facing untrusted clients on an untrusted network, it needs to gain more features. So things like TLS termination, right? You know, just offering a, a serving cert so you can do HTTPS, uh, rate limiting, authentication, authorization, uh, and then more advanced stuff like bot blocking and your web application firewall features like detecting injection payloads, that kind of stuff. So although it's a very blurry definition, I think all of these features made a load balancer into what we can sort of nebulously call an API gateway. So now that we've moved to microservices, you know, our monoliths are becoming distributed systems, we need a bunch of those features inside the network as well. So, you know, our reservability doesn't come from attaching a debugger to the monolith, it comes from looking at the, the requests that are happening on the wire. You know, things that were uh, yeah, a function call from one class into another that were effectively infinite and infallible are now network transactions that can fail, that can time out, that can be slow, that can need retrying. So all of this kind of routing and, uh, well, yeah, we used to have dependency injection frameworks, right? You wanted to, uh, you know, do you know, read some different config or access a different database in test, you would just use dependency injection. Uh, to, to do a sort of different build profile. We can't do any of that stuff anymore in the processes themselves because they're too small and too simple. So a lot of that stuff is now being done on the network. So that dumb load balancer in a fairly dumb load balancer in the middle has gained a lot of features and it's starting to look a lot like an API gateway. And in fact, a lot of API gateway software is being pressed into use uh, 
to perform this function. And I think the issue with this is that, is that it can do a lot, right? The issue is that it can maybe do too much uh, and that it's probably extensible as well. Uh, you know, you can just write a bit of Lua or something to plug in. So it, it's very easy for this to become an enterprise surface bus kind of thing, you know, from 2005. It's this sort of all-knowing traffic director that does all the surface discovery, holds all the credentials um, for things to talk to each other. It's the only policy enforcement point. Um, and, you know, and all of those extensions, all of those things that we can plug in, even the, the built-in features like the ability to, to just, you know, add a header here and manipulate a body there, just rename a field just so that a V1 request looks like a V2 request. All of that stuff sort of strikes terror into me of, of ESPs and, and makes me think of these systems that accreted so much, you know, duct tape uh, that nobody really understood. And of course, that duct tape isn't really duct tape. This is this is part of a running production system. So it's, you've got to consider it production code. It's also not giving us the security we think it is in this day and age. You know, the, the edge proxy works the edge proxy secures us from things on the internet because it's the only way in and out of the network and that's fine as long as we you know as long as all of our threats are outside um and then that's the only way in because you know the, the subnet is is literally unrootable but bitter experience shows us that not threats not all threats are on the outside um you know compromised services attempting lateral movement because probably because they've had a supply chain attack uh, or a disgruntled employees put some bad code in, or just somebody on the internal network because they've clean as plugged into an internet, any you know an Ethernet port, or somebody's cracked the Wi-Fi or something. And there's more and more of these devices on our networks now, um, with you know with bring your own device and with cloud computing and with one monolith becoming three thousand microservices. There's just more and more units of compute, more and more workloads that we have to worry about that could be a potential threat. So while an API gateway, you know, being used as a middle proxy might do authentication, that's kind of opt in, right? You've got to send your traffic through it with the right headers. If you if you don't have the right headers, what's to stop you going sideways like this? So on to sidecars. So the basic sidecar idea is the idea of taking this this you know middle proxy that's got a, a bunch of logic and logic that you know I agree that we need. I just don't think it should be here. So what a sidecar does is it moves it to each of the services. Right, so for example, I, I mean, some of them are maybe a little bit obvious, uh, like rate limiting. And each one of those sidecars can, can you know, rate limit on behalf of the you know, service it's running on. Um, load balancing is one people often get a bit confused about. You, you don't need a centralized load balancer. You know, each uh, service, uh, in this case, it's, it's sidecar, can know about all of the other potential services and it can choose which one to talk to. They can either coordinate through something called a look aside load balancer to uh, all make sure that then, you know, their random number generators aren't going to make them all hit the same one. Basically, they, they can look at the look aside load balancer to find out which of the potential backends has the, you know, the currently least connections from from all clients. So client side load balancing is actually perfectly valid and viable for you know, those back end kind of services for internal trusted services where we have control over the code so i've said sidecar a few times i mean i should actually have talked more generally about that logic so the first thing we did with with that logic you know that stuff that the api gateway was doing for us on the network retries timeouts caching authentication rate limiting all that kind of stuff the first thing we did was, you know, we, we factored it out into a library because like that Kong slide showed earlier, we don't want every microservice to have to, you know, re-implement that code. We don't want the developer of each service to have to reinvent that wheel and type the code out or copy and paste it in. So we, we factor it out. And there are a couple of early examples of this. We've got Hystrix and Finagle, um, which are both very full featured libraries that did this kind of stuff. The problem with those libraries is that they're still, you know, part of the same process. They're still part of the same build. So deployments and upgrades are coupled. You know, they're, they're reams of code. They're probably orders of magnitude more code than your business logic. So they actually have bug fix updates a lot more often. And every time they do, you have to roll your service. Um, 
you also practically speaking need an implementation in your language. Hystrix and Finagle were both JVM uh, based languages. So if you want to do Rust or something, then you know you're out of luck unless there's a decent implementation that comes along. So we factored it out even further, basically to a to an external process, um, a, a separate daemon that can do that kind of stuff in another process and can therefore you know have its configuration loaded, be restarted, be upgraded independently. So what kind of process, you know, what kind of software can we find that will do that for us? Well, it turns out they've already existed. You know, this this basically is an HTTP proxy, uh, you know, running as a reverse proxy. So, well, actually, arguably running as a forward proxy on the sort of client side, uh, and then a reverse proxy on the you know on the server side, on the callee side. So, you know, even Apache can do this if we press it. Uh, but Nginx, HA proxy are better at it. Uh, and the new call is a uh, sort of cloud native HTTP proxy called Envoy, which has a few advantages like being able to be configured over its API um, uh, in a you know on, in an online fashion. So if you want to change a setting on Nginx, you have to render out a config file, put it on disk, hit Nginx with sig hop. I think I don't think you actually have to quit it, but you do have to sort of hit it with a signal, and it will potentially drop uh, connections while it's reconfiguring itself. Envoy applies all of that stuff live. So yeah, as I say, this is the logo for Envoy. So Envoy is a good implementation of that. And we can now use nice, cool, modern programming languages, um, any language we want, rather than being stuck in the JVM. This is great for security too. Um, so you know, I talked before about how that API gateway middle proxy was, was opt-in and could be bypassed fairly easily. If you're running Kubernetes, uh, and each of these black boxes is a is a pod. Then your sidecar is, you know, a sidecar container, uh, so a separate container. It's in the same network namespace, uh, and the the actual business logic, the application process, is is unrootable from the outside. Right, the only way traffic can reach it is through the pod's single IP, and, and therefore through the sidecar, because that's where all traffic is is rooted. These you know, sidecars are also going to be present in in all traffic flows in and out of the pod. So um, whatever tries to call a particular service, no matter where on the network it is or you know how compromised it is, it's going to have to go through that sidecar. They kind of can't opt out. Um, so we therefore apply you know authentication, authorization, rate limit, etc., to everything. Even stuff that's you know internal in our network that you would have just been trusted because you know it was it's on the same network in the same cluster it, it came from a one nine two one six eight address we don't trust any of that anymore because it's so easy for this stuff to be compromised these days so this is an idea called zero trust because you you trust nothing basically uh, and I've put a few links up for for people who want to read more on that and just to quickly say they can also cover the egress case right you're trying to reach out to the cloud. All traffic goes through well, the cloud. Uh, so millennial of me, you're trying to reach out to you know things on the internet. Again, all, all traffic out of any business logic has to go through the sidecar. So these sidecars, they can do great things, but they can be quite tricky to configure. Um, you know, Nginx config files can get quite long if you want them to do a lot. Envoy's config is very long and fiddly. Uh, it's not really designed to be written by a human. Uh, and each of these sidecars is going to need a different config, you know, depending on this, the service that it's serving. Each one is going to have different uh, connections that it allows and, and different rate limits that it applies and whatever. So managing that configuration by hand is a nightmare. Uh, we very quickly came up with this idea of a control plane. So, you know, a, a daemon that provides a, a high level, simple sort of config uh, API, and we can give it high level notions like service A can talk to service B at 5 RPS uh, and it will then go and render the you know the long winded uh, individual configs needed for the sidecars and and go and configure them so uh, this control plane in addition to the sidecar proxies gives us what's called a service mesh Istio is probably the most famous of, uh, example you may have heard of it there's others others out there like Linkerd or uh, Cilium or AWS is some native app mesh. Just a note that if you're running your workloads in Kubernetes, then uh, you actually you can kind of get this service mesh uh, solution quite easily. So using various Kubernetes features, you can just 
make container images that contain just your business logic. You can write deployments that deploy just your business logic, you know, just one container in a pod with your container image in. And then using various Kubernetes features, you can have those uh, sidecars automatically injected. The, the service mesh gets um, its configuration API and storage hosted for free in the Kubernetes control plane. Uh, it, it can be it can be very simple to get started with one of these things if you're in a you know friendly high level compute environment like Kubernetes. So I just well just a, just a recap I guess I think you know we've seen what an API gateway is as a sort of piece of network equipment, what features it has, what why they used to be necessary, why they are still necessary but why in a microservice world having them all centralized in one place is maybe not the best thing and how we can move uh, a lot of those features uh, out to individual services through this sidecar pattern. So I just want to spend the last 10 minutes talking about some of the stuff we haven't touched on. So some of those API gateway features like enforcing request and response bodies, uh, like doing um, yeah, body transformation and, and all that kind of stuff because as I was saying API gateways some of them do offer these features but I don't think it's the right place for it I don't think it should be an infrastructure network concern I don't you know think it should be moved to a sidecar I think it should be dealt with completely differently so I'm now going to go through various stages of an API's life cycle and look at different tooling that we can use to help us out in all of those stages so we want to come along and, and design an API the first thing I would say is you should design your API up front. Um, this idea of, of schema driven development of sitting down and writing what the API is going to be because that's the sort of services contract uh, is really powerful. I've, I found it very useful personally. Uh, it can also be great for sort of more gated development processes. So if, if you need to go to a technical design review meeting to get you know sort of approval to spend six weeks writing your service or you, you need to go to a sort of uh, budget holders review meeting to get the investment then you know going with maybe a sketch of the architecture and and the contract the schema I, I found to be a really powerful thing so schema driven development I, I think is, is really useful it really clarifies what this service is for and what it does and you know what services it's going to offer to whom so if you're going to be writing um, definitions of, of REST interfaces then you're almost certainly writing open API files. That's kind of the standard. You can do that with Vim uh, or with your IDE with, with various plugins, but there's also software packages out there that sort of support this first class. So things like Stoplight and Postman and Kong's Insomnia. If you're writing protobuf files describing gRPC APIs, which I would encourage you to do, by the way, I think gRPC is great. It's got a, it's got a bunch of advantages. Um, not just around the sort of API design, but it's just around, you know, actual runtime network usage kind of stuff, then you're going to be writing proto files. Again, you can use Vim, you can use your IDE and some plugins. I don't personally know of any uh, first class tools that uh, support this at the moment, but somebody please chime in if I've missed anything. So what happens when I want to come to implement the service behind this API? The first thing to do, I think, is to is to generate all of the things, right? Generate stubs, uh, generate basically an SDK for the client side and generate stub hooks on the server side. So all of that boilerplate code for say hosting a REST API where you open a socket and you attach a HTTP you know, MUX router kind of thing and you register uh, logging middleware and all that kind of stuff. That's boilerplate code. Yeah, you can copy and paste it. Yeah, you can factor it out into a microservices framework, but you can also generate it from these API definition files um, and then they will you know leave you with code where you just have to write the handlers for the business logic same on the client side you can generate your client libraries SDKs whatever you want to call them that you know are library code where you write the business logic um, and then you you make one function call to um, you know hit an API endpoint on a remote service and you can just kind of assume that it works because all of the finding the service serializing the request body, you know, sending it, retrying it, timing it out, all of that kind of stuff is taken care of. So again, you can just focus on writing business logic. Now, one of the main 
reasons I think for doing this is we we used to use well I often see API gateways used for um, enforcing request schemas on the wire. Perhaps a service A will will send a request to service B, and the API gateway will be configured to check that its its body has you know it's the JSON document that it's sending has the right schema. This just becomes unnecessary if all all you're ever doing is calling auto-generated client stubs to send requests and you know hooking into auto-generated server stubs to send responses. It's not possible to send the wrong um, body schema because you're not generating it and serializing it. Right? You're you'll you'll typically new up an instance of a class. You'll you'll fill in the fields. Right? So you'll have to fill in all of the fields and you, you can't fill any extra fields. And then the stubs will sort of take it from there and they'll serialize it um, and they'll do any um, you know, field validation on, on integer size or string length or whatever. So by using these client stubs, you just a whole class of errors just, just goes away and gets, gets caught a lot earlier. So generating stubs uh, from open API documents for REST. There's a few tools out there. Um, there's Azure Open REST which uh, gets a fair amount of love, but only supports a few languages. There's this project called OpenAPI Generator. Um, its main advantage is that it's got templates for like a zillion languages. Um, in fact, for Python, I think it's got four separate templates, so you, you choose your favorite. I, I do have to say from a, a lot of bit of practical experience that most of those templates aren't very good. The code they emit is is very elaborate, very complicated, very slow, and just not idiomatic at all. Um, your mileage may vary, and you can write your own templates, although that's not easy. So it's a nice idea. I've sadly not had a great amount of success with that tool. Um, even the API, AWS API Gateway can do this. Did you know? If you if you it's it's not a great dev experience, but if you take an open API file and you you upload it into AWS API Gateway, which is kind of the same thing as you know clicking through the UI and making uh, paths and methods and all that kind of stuff um, there's an AWS CLI command that'll get you get you a stub um, but it only works for like two languages and they they seem pretty basic doing the same for for gRPC then there's the original you know upstream Google uh, protoc protoc proto compiler and uh, it, it has a plugin mechanism so the, you, there needs to be a plugin for your language and there's there's plugins for most of the major languages it's fine, uh, but there's this new tool called Buff, which I think is a lot better. So when we've done that, we, we really hopefully get to this point of just add business logic, right? So we can see this um, service on the bottom left is you know a, a client that's calling the service on the top right, which is which is a server. And a distinction becomes kind of irrelevant in, in microservices often, but you know. In this case, we've got one thing calling another to make it simple. Yeah, that server side has business logic, and that really can just be business logic because network concerns like rate limiting and authentication or whatever are taken care of by the sidecar. And then things like um, body deserialization, uh, uh, body schema validation, all of that kind of stuff are taken care of by the it, just the boilerplate like open this socket and set the buffer a bit bigger so we can go faster all of that stuff's taken care of in the generated uh, server stub code likewise on the client the sidecar is doing sort of retries and, and caching for us and then the business logic here can um, can call on three separate services and it has a generated client stub uh, for each one so when we want to deploy these services, um, schema validation, right, that we used to configure on an API gateway, well, I'm going to say uh, don't, because I've talked about how we can we can sort of shift that left and how we can we don't make those mistakes if we use generated code. Um, I have I have actually already covered it, but uh, the the IDLs tend to only be expressive to the sort of granularity of oh the field um, email is is a string. There are uh, enhancements and plugins, um, I think for Open API, certainly for Proto, um, where you can give more uh, validation. So you can say that you know the field email is is a string. It's a minimum of six characters. It's got to have an ampersand in the middle. It's got to um, match a certain regular expression. So that kind of fine grained stuff can can all be done, you know, declaratively in your IDL, and there, therefore you know uh, 
generated into, into automatic code at build time. What happens when we want to publish these things? So buff, for example, and this is just one example, um, Spotlight and, and things, uh, uh, Postman all offer this, this as well, I think. Um, but buff has a schema registry. So I can take, you know, uh, my proto buff file on the left and I can upload it into, into the buff schema registry. And, uh, there's a hosted version or you can run your own and you can see that it's it's done, you know, sort of, um, you know, Rust docs or Go docs. It, it's, it's rendered this nicely into the documentation with hyperlinks. Uh, but but now I've got a you know, nice documentation for what this API is, you know, what services it offers, how I should call them. Um, and I've got a catalog by looking at the, you know, the whole um, schema registry. I've got a catalog for all the APIs available in my organization, all the services I can get from all the running microservices. And this is really, really useful for, um, you know, discovering that kind of stuff. The, the amount of time, um, you know, in previous jobs, I've had people say, oh, I'd, I'd love to write that code, but this piece of information isn't available or, you know, I'm going to spend a week writing the code to sort of extract um, some data from the database and, and transform it when a service to do that already exists. So we can find them a lot more easily now. So yeah, there's this kind of idea of, you know, ambient APIs. You just push all your schema, um, publish all your schema to, to the schema registry and then others can search them, others can find them. You can take that stub generation and you can put it in your CI system. So um, when you're automatically building those stubs, you automatically build those stubs in, in CI every time uh, the, the IDL you know, proto definition file changes and those built stubs are, are pushed to your pip or uh, NPM or your internal artifactory or whatever. So that if I'm writing a new service that wants to, you know, call a service called foo, I can just, if I'm, if I'm writing in Python, I just pip install foo service client. I don't have to go and grab the IDL and run the tooling on it myself and do the, do the generation. I don't have to copy the, the code into my code base. I can, I can depend on it as a package. And then I can use something like Dependabot to automatically upgrade those stubs. So if a new version of the API is published, then uh, a new version of the you know, client library that can call all of the new methods will be generated and Dependabot can, can you know, come along and suggest or even do the upgrade for me. So what when I want to I modify an API, right? It's going through its life cycle. Well, we should version them. We should version them from day one and we should use Semver to do that, right? Probably sucking eggs, but it's worth saying. So when I want to go from 1.0 to 1.1, you know, this is a non-breaking change. We're just, say, adding a method. Well, I've, like I've already said, you know, CICD will spot the new IDL file, generate and publish new clients. Dependabot can come along and it's, it should be safe to automatically upgrade the services that use them. Um, you know, and then next time you're hacking on your business logic, you can just call a new method. You know, you press client library dot in your IDE and, and autocomplete will tell you, the the latest set of you know methods that are available because they're their local function calls on that SDK. When I want to go to v2, so this is a breaking change. You know, say I've removed a method, renamed a field. Well, the, again, CI/CD can can spot that new IDL file, generate a new client uh, with a v2 version on the package now, and publish that. But people are going to have to manually do this dependency upgrade because the API changed on the wire then the, the API for the SDK is also going to change in, in, a, in a breaking way. You, you might be calling the method on the SDK that called the, you know, the endpoint on the API that's being removed. So this is a potentially breaking change um, and people have to you know, uh, do the upgrade manually and, and deal with any fallout in, in their code. The best thing to do is to not make breaking changes, right? Is to just go to 1.2 or 1.3 and never actually have to declare v2. We can do this with breaking change detection. So the buff tool, and this is one of the reasons I like it so much, can do this for proto buff files. So given an old and a new proto buff file coming through your CI system, buff can tell you whether the difference between them is a breaking change or, or an additive one. And that's really, really nice for stopping people, you know, make him think, oh, I didn't mean to that for that to be a breaking change or, oh yeah, that is annoying. Let me think if I can do this in a way that, that isn't breaking on the wire. 
So how do we deprecate them? If I if I have had to make a V2.0, I don't really want V1.0 to be hanging around for a long time because realistically I'm going to have to offer both, right? It's a breaking change. Maybe all the clients aren't up to date yet. I, I want to get them up to date. I want to get them all calling V2, but you know, until they are, I've got to keep serving V1 because you know a V1 only client is not compatible with my new V2. So yeah, as I say, keep offering V1. Uh, a way to offer and do this is you know you take your refactored improved code that sort of natively has a V2 API, and you can write an adapter layer that uh, will keep serving V1. If if the code is, it has to be so different, then then yeah, you can have two different code bases and, and two different pods running. And then the advantage of the sort of approach I've been talking about is you can go and proactively uh, deprecate these uh, these older clients. So yeah, the, the way you need to do that is you need to be, make sure that no one's still using it, right? So we, we've got V2 now, where we, we want everybody to be using V2, we want to turn off V1. So we want to delete that code in the pod that's offering V1 or turn off the old V1 pods or whatever it is. We can't do that if people are still using it obviously, or potentially still using it. Like the amount of people I've seen try to work out if V1 is still being used by just looking at, at logs or sniffing network traffic, right? That's only data from the last five minutes or seven days or something. That doesn't tell you, I, mean, I used to work in a financial institution, it doesn't tell you whether, you know, you turn it off now in 11 months when it comes around to year end, some batch process or some subroutine is going to run that's going to need uh, that's good. You know, that's good. Expect going to expect to be able to call V1, and it's going to blow up, and you're going to have a big problem. If we build those client stubs uh, into packages and we push them to, you know, something like a, a PIP registry, then we can use dependency scanners because we can see which uh, repos in our in our GitHub are importing, you know, Foo Service Client version 1.x. So, but, but yeah, if, if we insist that people use client stubs to call everything uh, and we insist that they get those client stubs from the published packages then the only way anybody can possibly ever call v1 even if they're not doing it now is if their code imports you know foo client you know foo auto generated client uh library v1 so we can use a security dependent scanner dependency scanner to go and find that um, and then we can you know go and talk to them or at least we've got a visibility at least even if they you know they can't or won't change we know it's not safe to turn off v1 so thank you everyone um, I've run out of time so I'll, I'll leave this slide here so you can pause it uh, come back to it it basically says for all of the features that you're probably getting from an API gateway where should it go there are actually a couple of cases where you do need to keep an API gateway, you know, those those kind of features, things like advanced um, web application firewall stuff, uh, yeah, advanced sort of AI based uh, bot blocking, all of that kind of stuff. I haven't seen any sidecars that do that yet, that the sort of product marketplace is just less mature. It's full of open source software at the moment. And, you know, these are big, uh, heavy R&D sort of value adds. So you might you might want to keep a, you know, a network gateway. Um, but for internal stuff, um, this is talking about whether you want to move that code actually into the, the service itself, into the business logic, whether you want to use a service mesh sidecar or whether you want to shift it left. So to conclude, I think API gateways is a sort of nebulous term um, for a bunch of features that have been piled into, into what used to be ingress proxies. These features are useful, um, so API gateways are, are being used to provide them, but they're now being used in places they're not really suited, you know, like the middle of microservices. Service meshes and then the shift, shift left API management tooling can take on most of what an API gateway does. Uh, I, I, like I said, API gateways still have a place, um, especially for sort of internet facing egress, in ingress. Uh, you actually probably need something like a CDN, uh, and, you know, regional caching even further left than your API gateway anyway. You know, in this day and age, you, you probably shouldn't actually have an API gateway exposed to the raw internet. Uh, and these patterns like um, uh, CDNs and, and edge compute and service meshes are, are all standard now, I would say. So I wouldn't be afraid of adopting them. I, th I think this is a reasonably well-trodden path. So for practical takeaways, you can implement incrementally adopt sidecars that the service meshes support incremental rollouts 
um, to your workloads one by one, so I wouldn't be too worried about that. I think sidecars will get more of these API gateway features, like the advanced WAF stuff over time, so I don't think you're painting yourself into a black hole. You're not um, giving yourself a, a much bigger operational burden overhead for, forever. Um, check out what your CDN can do, you know, when you've got those few features left in the API gateway. If CDNs can be really sophisticated these days. You might find that they can do everything that's left and you, you really can get rid of the API gateway. That shift left uh, management tooling can also be incrementally adopted. Um, and even if you're not ready to adopt any of this stuff, if I've convinced you this is a good way of doing things and you think it's a good North Star, then you can certainly design with this stuff in mind. So thank you everyone, and I think now we're on to Q&A. Thank you, Matt. Always good to see you. And you, sir. Um, so a few questions that came in. Um, I want to jump in here and ask some of those. Uh, I didn't scroll up. There's a few more that I saw, too. Okay. Yeah, I've been trying um, to get through them. Yeah. Say again? I've been trying to get through them. Sorry. I'll just uh, yeah go for it, and I'll... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, want, I want to talk about... Um, you know, you mentioned in the chat, for example, what problem are you trying to solve? Um, and you, I think that's a great first question. So when, when we're talking about um, moving from an API gateway to a service mesh, if, if you're in more of a, something where the network isn't as predominant, um, when do you start, I, you got more of a like modular monolith. When do you start really thinking uh, service mesh uh, is a good solution to start solving some of your problems? At what point does like in a modular monolith, do you, is it a good idea to begin implementing a service mesh? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I do like a service mesh, I won't lie, but I, I, I would say there's no reason not to do that from the start. I mean, even if you have, in, in the worst case where you have just the one monolith, right, it still needs that, that ingress piece, that in and out of the network to the internet, which is probably what a more traditional API gateway or load balancer is doing. A service mesh will bring um, an ingress layer of its own that can do, you know, a lot of those features. Like I say, maybe not everything. If you if you're subscribed to an expensive API gateway that's going to do like AI based bot detection and stuff, but you know, if if it satisfies your needs and it can do a bunch of stuff, and then as soon as you do start to split that monolith up, you you don't ever have to be in the position of writing any of that resiliency code or whatever or suffering outages because of networking problems. If you see what I mean, you sort of sort of get it there proxying all of the traffic in, in and out, you can get a baseline, you can see that it works, it doesn't affect anything. And then as soon as you make that first split into, you know, mm -hmm. split one little satellite off, implement one new separate service, then you're already used to running this thing and operating it and, and you get the advantages straight away. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. Um, one of the other common things we hear when you first start talking about service mesh, particularly in that journey from like modular monolith into microservices is like the overhead cost, right? Like we're taking a bunch of those cross-cutting features like retries and um, uh, circuit breakers out of libraries and putting them into reverse proxies that run in it that has that, that overhead cost. How do you answer people? Like when you say, when they say, I, I don't want to pay the, the, the overhead of having a uh, reverse proxy at the, at the ingress to each one of my services. Sure. Um, I mean, it might not be for you, you know, if you if you are high frequency trading or doing something else, I, I think it's going to depend on on your requirements, right? And knowing them, maybe if you haven't done it yet, going through that exercise of, of agreeing and writing down, you, you know, your SLAs and your SLOs to, to know, because this might be an implicit thing and the people are just sort of a bit scared. So, you know, write it down. Why do you do you, can you cope with a 500 millisecond response time? Do you need 50? You know, where are you at now? How much budget is there left? Um, you know, I would say that that code is, is either happening anyway, you know, in a, in a library, um, in which case there are going to be the cycles used within your process and you're just moving them out. Um, or maybe it's not happening at all, right? So things look fast, but are you prepared to swap a few dollars of cloud compute cost for a better working product? Um, but but yes, I mean having you know having that as a as a separate process, there's going to be a few more cycles used because it's got to do a bit of its own gatekeeping. Ideas it, they do use a fair amount of RAM typically, as I say, you know that's maybe a cost benefit thing. They do have a th theoretical throughput limit, but what I'd say is that's probably 
hire, you know, these proxies do one job and they do it well. Envoy's written in C++, the Linkerd one's written in Rust. You know, these are pretty high performance systems languages. The chances of their cap on throughput being lower than, than your application that's maybe written in Java or Python or Node is actually fairly low. Again, depends on your environment, you know, measure and test, but. It's a trade-off, right? I mean, you're you're taking you're focusing on the business lock it, logic and trading off um, a little bit of a little bit of performance. That it's all it's all about trade-offs. You may be trading off that performance so that you don't have to worry about dealing with the circuit breakers, the retries. You can push that into the uh, kind of different tier. Um, at least those are some of the things that I've heard in that space. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're trading a few dollars for the for the convenience and the features. You're trading some milliseconds of latency for the same thing. But yeah, as I say, if it's slowing you down a lot, that's probably because you're introducing this stuff for the first time and it's probably well worth it. Yeah, the only time where it's not a trade-off or it's you know, a sort of straight up hindrance is, is probably that cap, that that cap on queries per second throughput. But as I say, like unless you've got some some sort of well optimized C, you're writing like a trading system or something, then the chances are it's not your bottleneck. And it won't be. So there really isn't a trade-off there. And sidecars, this is where you can you can channel Liz Rice, the conversation that we, we had before. And if you want to hear more about this, I think uh, next week Liz Rice will be talking uh, as well about EBPF. But if there is sidecar or not sidecar. Like we've been talking kind of like an Istio kind of Envoy side mar sidecar model. But there are interesting things happening without sidecars to be able to implement service meshes, right? Any thoughts or comments there? No, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's a good point that this is, I guess, the worst case, you know, the model we have now gets things working. This, the service mesh folks have been using Envoy. It, it is very good what it does, you know, it, it already exists, but it's, it's a separate Unix process. Um, so yeah, I think things aren't bad at the moment, but with uh, BPF moving things into the kernel, there's this thing called the Istio CNI. Like if you're really deep into your, into your Kubernetes, then uh, the Istio folks have written a CNI plugin, which actually provides, you know, the the interface into the, your pods network namespace so that you don't have to use IP tables to um, um, sort of forcefully intercept the traffic, which means you save a hop into kernel space and back. So yeah, basically te technological advancement is happening in this space. It's only getting better. So you're probably okay with the trade-offs now. And, and if you're not, you know, watch this space, go look at some of the more advanced technologies coming out of the, the FDIO um, VPP folks or Cilium or that kind of stuff. So yeah, just very exciting. Um, any thoughts on on uh, serverless? Is are, are these type of things all provided by the provider? Um, are you, you're, there isn't really like a service mesh that you can implement, is it just at the provider? Um, what are your thoughts if some people are in the uh, serverless world? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I'll confess I'm not completely au fait with serverless, so I don't, I don't know the details of sort of every provider, uh, yeah, strapping, if I think of a serverless uh, product like a, uh, a K-native surf or an open fans, you know, something yeah. that runs as a, as a workload in Kubernetes, then as far as Kubernetes is concerned, that's kind of opaque, and, you know, and it may well be hosting a lot of right. different functions. So if you deploy your service mesh in Kubernetes, then you're going to get one sidecar that sits alongside, you know, that whole blob. So it will do something, but it's almost like an ingress component into that separate little world that may or may not be, you know, what you want. You may be able to get some value out of it, you'll, you'll get the observability piece at least. Um, I don't yeah. personally know of any serverless, you know, native and any service meshes that it can, can extend into serverless. And I don't know enough about serverless to know what these individual platforms like a Lambda or an OpenFAS offers natively, I'm, I'm afraid. Outside of like Knative, for example, they can, they can run on cluster. Yeah, but what you'll get is, I guess, Knative is maybe its own little world. So Kubernetes will see one pod, and it, but that'll actually run lots of different functions, right? So a service mesh is going to sort of apply to that to that whole pod. So it's going to apply sort of equally to all of those functions. It doesn't have too much sure. visibility all right. inside. We are at time. If you want to keep the conversation going, we didn't really dive into CICD. So if you want to ask some more questions on CICD and shift left with Matt, join us in the Zoom room after this. We will have Daniel Mangum talking about on-off cluster, uh, managing on-off cluster resources um, in the follow-on talk. Uh, other than that, we'll see you in the uh, Zoom room here in just a few. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.